Let's talk. Nice. Are we warmed up? A bumblebee, 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 bumblebee. Hello, and welcome to season two, episode one of Spencer and Zach explore the universe. Holy shit! Whoa, whoa, left field. And now rated R. Now, yeah, right. <laughs> I mean, I, I just feel like uh, your your inherent good nature will take this closer to a thirteen, <laughs> PG thirteen, yeah, at the least. Tone my, if not a, a family friendly rated G. Yeah, it's occasional bad language. <laughs> yeah. Um, who's Zach? Some of you might be asking, and to it to what I would say, like, thanks for listening. To the previous episodes, Zach Jones. Yes, is are you ready? Oh, Sit back. I am. Do you, have, do you have a beverage? I do. I've got two. What are you working on? I've got a cup of coffee, mm-hmm. and I also have a screwdriver. Really? You're doing the one-two oh, punch. Yeah. That's right. Um, I have just finished my cup of tea, and uh, and I have a water as well. Ooh. So for for the following. Um, uh, dissertation. Uh, I would suggest the screwdriver, which it sounds like you have chosen. So, um, Zach Jones uh, is a supremely talented multi instrumentalist slash performer slash singer slash songwriter, general entertainer. I would say he's a sharp dresser, and he is a kind person inherently. Uh, 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 like almost like a terribly kind person, like upsettingly kind, um, shockingly kind, I would say, um, inappropriately kind. Uh, and additionally has an encyclopedic knowledge of, uh, pop culture that mirrors my own, dare I say, somewhat, uh, vast knowledge of the same sect of pop culture. So, um, whereas Zach, who is also additionally, I'm going to, I'm going to say this, Zach, you're my bestie. Aw. Yeah. I love you. But I'm not your bestie. <laughs> um, no, that's fine. I've got a top 10 list about that later. This feels forced. <laughs> <Whew>. <laughs> Anyway, <gasps> awkward. I mean, this is weird. Anyway, uh, one of my best friends, Zach Jones, uh, <laughs> is, <laughs> uh, from York, Maine, like myself. Uh, we used to be bandmates, and we have spent countless thousands of hours shoulder to shoulder watching and oftentimes rewatching good movies, bad movies, and listening to music. And uh, providing commentary heard only by each other and perhaps um, our annoyed bandmates at the time. Fair to say? Very fair to say. Okay, very good. Um, Zach, after we were in a band together, even though we are frequent collaborators throughout this period of time, moved to Los Angeles. That's in uh, California, the uh, country of California. Mm-hmm. And, uh, you know, people get busy with their lives. And, and even though we had plans to have Zach involved in the podcast um, through various sketches and whatnot, you know, it's just kind of difficult to connect sometimes. But now, in the current times, and I, I apologize if you're learning about this here, there's a, there's a bit of a pandemic on. And, uh, yeah, so that's kind of changed a lot of people's lives and... Zach finds himself back in Maine, uh, sheltering with his family, which uh, I'm grateful for, even though we don't really get to see each other often because, again, there's a, uh, and I, I'm sorry if I'm upsetting people, there's a, there's a bit of a pandemic on. Um, but we both find ourselves uh, again, which is a rare gift, with uh, time 
which is hard to come by sometimes in the rat race of life. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we have decided to join forces on this podcast and uh, just see where it takes us. And with that, I would love to open up the floor. Uh, Ladies and germs, Zach Jones. (laughs) Thank you for that thunderous applause, Mm. ladies and gentlemen. I greatly appreciate it. I'm very happy to be here. I am uh, thrilled to be once again collaborating with my good friend Spencer. But not and if you don't mind, Spencer, I, I would like to take some time to uh, say a few kind words about you. Oh my goodness! Let me uh, In... let me grab my scotch. Oh, are you still scotch grabbing, or can I go on now? I was scotch slurping. Uh, oh, sorry. But by all That's... means, carry on. Sorry to interrupt. Well, I just have to say. Spencer, you are my absolute best advocate for listing things that are great about me. <laughs> I'm happy. I am so glad I can be there for you in this uh, delicate capacity. <laughs> and I greatly appreciate it. And yes, you are my best friend. I love you. Oh, I love you too. Although it did take you a long time. I, I feel like... Honestly, if that's how if, if that's how you really felt, it would just it would have like been like an immediate reaction, you know. But, <laughs> well, you know, we'll, uh, we 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 have time now to, to talk about things and and really get down to the heart of our heart of our relationship. Well, let's say that uh, there certainly have been times when uh, we've certainly been best friends, and so one of my goals through season one of Spencer and Zach explore the universe would be to reclaim unequivocally my place at your side as your undoubted best friend. Aww. Well, the dog is doing an excellent job, so uh, the dog? got competition. <laughs> this is horrendous. <laughs> this isn't working out. Well, let's go back to just Zach or Spencer explores yeah, the universe. Yeah, let's just get down to the pop culture <laughs> shit. This relationship stuff is really <laughs> sucking. So, um, Spen- first guest is going to be a psychiatrist. Yeah. <laughs> first guest is going to be a new best friend for me. That's what's going to happen. And I'll at least have the common decency to have it be a, a, not a dog. <laughs> I was going to say, is it just going to be Spencer and Pete the dog explore the universe? <laughs> Maybe I'll just have Pete the dog. <laughs> if he disagrees with me, I don't understand the language. So, yeah. Wouldn't that be funny to find out that like Pete the dog just thinks I'm a, a, a huge asswipe? <laughs> 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 the way he shows it is by like snuggling with me and... Yeah. Demanding that you feed him. Yep. Yeah, exactly. So excited for food. So uh, this show... Uh, though it has changed in format and uh, host personship, is that a word? Is now, uh, it is still. I'll that. What's that? I said I will accept that okay. word. Then, then it is. Um, it is still brought to you by Main Spirits. Main Spirits brings all of the uh, liquors and all that good stuff. Uh, the making the fixins for Zach's screwdriver into the state of Maine. You can find out more about what the hell they're up to over at mainspirits.com. You can follow them on Instagram, uh, main underscore spirits, at main underscore spirits. And they also have an app for your smartphone, which doesn't do Zach much good because they do not have an app for the Razer phone. So, but I'll, I'll show you, I'll show you the app sometime from a distance soon. Yeah, you might say I'm behind the times on that, but I would argue that maybe they're behind the times on that. Yeah, that's yeah. Well, <laughs> it might not be, might not be a strong argument. No, you you can run with that mantle if you want. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah. Well, well, Spencer, as you pointed out, we have uh, consumed countless countless hours of multimedia together. Countless. And uh, we love to procure our media from Bull Moose, mm-hmm. and that's Bull true. Moose has locations throughout Maine and New Hampshire. And they are, once again, open for retail with uh, safety guidelines because there is a, a, a pandemic going on. What? Um, yeah. So, sorry if you're just, oh just hearing God. about that now. 
But Bull Moose uh, also has an online presence, like most businesses do th- these days. Mm-hmm. So visit bullmoose.com for more information. Mm-hmm. They have a the same website that they launched in 96. It's uh, done in Microsoft Paint. <laughs> um, no, you can actually order... You can order things from them if you're still not comfortable leaving the house, which is understandable. Because as Zach uh, just shocked me with the news, uh, there's a bit of a pandemic on. And uh, so they'll deliver to you, or I think they're still even doing curbside pickup. But the stores are open, and uh, yeah, uh, we love Bull Moose for yes, we do their undying support, and also just I mean honestly, I just love the place. It's one of the one of the first places I have gone. Um, in these now times uh, that didn't sell me something that uh, would directly result in survival. (laughs) Or, I don't know, uh, you know, mind food is essential for survival, I would argue. Yep, I think that's fair. It might be a stronger argument than my Moto Razor argument. (laughs) I will agree with that. (laughs) I'll join you on that one. You're alone on the Razor, though. Um, and then we're also brought to you by Sun Tiki Studios on Forest Avenue in Portland, Maine. Sun Tiki Studios is a top-notch rehearsal and performance facility. Obviously, they're, like everyone else, their business model has been compromised by the current matters at hand, though they are introduced. They that I said have and I've at the same time. They, I've introduced. <laughs> they've introduced um, safe distance rehearsing. Um, they are keeping the facility incredibly clean ventilated and spaced out so if you want to reach out uh, and get the old band back together safely um suntiki studios.com is where it's at you can also find them on facebook speaking of facebook uh what a dumpster fire that is <laughs> yes. holy shit <laughs> wow. oh man don't like it but that's all i mean that's, that's all i have to say about facebook I, the, the, the aspects i do like about facebook and there are some uh, are mostly usurped by um, horseshit at this point mm-hmm. for me. So, yeah, it's it's uh, not always been a fun place to hang out no, recently. Not especially well, recently. Yeah, and by recently, you mean over the past uh, four years? Oh, decade maybe. Yeah, decade know. maybe. But yeah, you can find Suntiki on Facebook. <laughs> <laughs> Um, and yeah, I guess with that, we will play this, uh, we'll play this fancy note, uh, uh, noise here, uh, to let you know that we have a budget, not really. Uh, and then we'll, we'll get into the, the meat and potatoes of today's show. Here's that noise I was talking about earlier. And just like that, we're in the show. Um, sounded expensive, didn't it? Sure did. Yeah. We should just keep bashing Facebook though until they pony up some money, and then we'll get really yeah, expensive. Because that's how you, that's how you get sponsorships. <laughs> yeah, I, I thought we were like in a bullying culture now. I thought that's what Facebook was all about. I think it, that is what Facebook's all about. Is that how they <laughs> respond? Like, I, I have no idea. I mean, it's that, only one way to find out. That is how I uh, initially got Mean Spirits and uh, Bull Moose to be involved. Is I just started berating them um, <laughs> yeah. via any just any channel I could get. I mean, it wasn't until I. I leaned into uh, bashing um, both of them on LinkedIn that they really caved and decided to sponsor the show. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I just kept hounding their uh, long abandoned Friendster accounts <laughs> until they had no choice but to check it. Because and... <laughs> <laughs> they're getting email notifications. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, Zach, Zach J, uh, DMB, Fish, <laughs> 21. <laughs> Has sent you yet another message. <laughs> even, the, even the notification thing is getting annoyed by it. Uh, <laughs> it's like, you won't believe this. Yep. <clears throat> you, this guy hit up your Friendster page again. Who else should we uh, berate into uh, sponsoring the show? Oh, that's a good question. I don't. I mean, are we after the big bucks? Yeah, um, we're not going. We're not going for small change here. Well, you know what I hate. What do you? you hate? Know what I think is absolutely terrible. What's that? Is uh, Amazon, and I'm not going to shut up about Amazon until they give us some funding. Actually, <laughs> that's kind of easy. To, they're an easy company to bash. <laughs> <laughs> yes, they are. You know what really grinds my gears? The American Red Cross. 
yeah. <laughs> yeah. Thanks for the help. Yeah, thanks for all the help. Jokers. <laughs> yeah. You know what I you know what I can't but, stand? Uh, what can't you stand? I don't know. Tell I was me. trying to think of some other charitable organization to yeah. tear down. But then I remember yeah. they, 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 they're seeking sponsorship, not really in the business of doling it out. Yeah. yeah that went wrong. Well, should we uh, get into some pop culture conversation? Jesus Christ. Like, you, first episode, you're already, like, just taking over. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Horse shit. <laughs> yeah, like, okay. Let's, let's, get down to, let's get down to brass tacks. Yeah, let's get down to business here because I'm not having any fun just talking no. about random shit. This is a bad show. Um, yeah. yeah, so what we're going to do today, and we're just going to try a bunch of shit. Here, here's our plan. Uh, we have this podcast. We're somehow funded, and we're going to talk about whatever we want. And uh, hopefully you might find some of it interesting. <laughs> <laughs> Hopefully you find all of it interesting. Yeah, that's 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 the the primary goal. Yeah, but, but hopefully, yeah, if it's not find... the case, you don't find any of it interesting. In, in which case, we might have to sit about braiding a whole new set of sponsors. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> Gotta get those numbers up, Zach. <clears throat> so yeah, uh, so today we're going to talk about the classic British comedy, um, Faulty Towers. Now I'm going to leave space for you to uh, jump in there, Zach. Well, uh, so this show was introduced to me by my good and best friend, Spencer Albee. Still not buying that it. That being you. <laughs> Still not buying <laughs> it. <laughs> uh, I would say it was probably like circa 2003-ish when we uh, shared our first apartment in uh, Portland mm-hmm, together. Mm-hmm. And um, the days. we back in the days, the days. Back in the day. we were so young. We had our whole futures ahead of us. Uh, the hair, oh, the hair, the luxurious uh, hair, the, the sumptuous heads of cabbage. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would say that period of time was uh, it, there. There was like a new wave of what I, I have been referring to, and I think maybe lots of other people do, but I forgot to Google it torture and, porn. and see if it's an actual term. <laughs> yeah, torture porn. Yeah. Uh, or cringe comedy. Mm. Um, around that time, it was like, you know, the, the British office was getting popular here. I don't think they had spun off on the American one yet, but, um, you know, that was happening. And then Ricky Gervais spun that into extras, which is also yeah. totally uncomfortable. <laughs> yeah. And then uh, Curb Your Enthusiasm was oh. happening. Like the Meet the Parents movies had happened. Like yes. all these like comedic scenarios that are that make you horribly uncomfortable and give you no choice but to laugh really hard at them. Uh, and I remember, I think we were watching, uh, you know, the early seasons of Curb Your Enthusiasm, and you were like, if you think this makes you uncomfortable, <laughs> look at this. <laughs> if you think you hate this. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and you had the the, the complete uh, Faulty Towers DVD set. And I had always been a fan of Monty Python, because anybody who has a brain is a fan of Monty yeah. Python. <laughs> you're not an idiot. That's why and, you're a fan of Monty Python. Uh, and I have always, you know, loved John Cleese. And somehow had never seen the show before. I don't. I mean, I'd seen uh, some pictures and images from it, and I think, like you know, the we're obviously going to get through the episodes here mm-hmm. in a minute. But the there's a couple iconic moments in the show that I had seen images from, and I think in my mind they were like the faulty. T- or, sorry, they were Monty Python sketches that I just hadn't discovered yet. Yeah, because it kind of like it's looks like, the same. It's like the same era video and production value, and obviously star. Mm-hmm. Yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, the show. But, uh, oh, I'm sorry. Go ahead. Oh, sorry. No, 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 this show is the architect of the the discomfort causing sitcom, <laughs> mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and I'm sure that there are there are other shows that have elements of it that predate it that you know kind of influenced and informed them. But like as far as it coming together into this new form, and what's funny too is that it uh, um, it took actually quite a while, like thirty years, 
for it to kind of become a mainstream thing again. Faulty Towers never made uh, a splash over here. It probably had something to do with distribution. The first time I saw it was on PBS in the same, you know, programming sweep says Doctor Who and, oh, Upstairs, Downstairs. Man, I couldn't get enough of that. <laughs> what a show. It takes place both up and downstairs. Incredible. Um, oh, wow. <clears throat> there's Are You Being Served? There's that whole, like, slew of early British comedies, obviously Monty Python, and those are all carried on uh, PBS. Though this show was remade uh, for American television on three different occasions. It was. I actually have the information on that in front of me. I can tell you Spill exactly it. what they were. Spill it. Uh, the first was Chateau Snavely, starring <laughs> Harvey Corman and Betty White. It was produced by ABC in 1978. I mean, those are two uh, incredibly talented people. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, the, ser- the series went to pilot and was never produced. Mm-hmm. Uh, the second attempt, also by ABC, was called Amanda, and it starred B. Arthur. And uh, it was notable for switching the sexes of the two main characters, uh, Basil and Sybil. Mm-hmm. Um, that was, let's see, it was dropped after 10 episodes. There are 13 episodes produced. Mm-hmm. And then the third remake, it was 1999. It was produced by and starring John Larroquette, and it was called Pain. Uh, and that went, see, nine episodes were produced, eight of which went to air. Mm-hmm. So there you go. Three yeah. American attempts I weirdly <laughs> all failed. I mean, every other, like, I assume Harvey Corman was, like, the Basil character. Uh, and I assume mm-hmm. that B. Arthur was the, the Basil character. Um, yeah. And I can see both of them in that role. John Larroquette uh, from, of Night Court fame. Um, I don't know. I, I, I'm not, I don't know if I'm seeing it. No disrespect to John Larroquette. Very, very... Uh, uh, very funny in his own right, but um, mm-hmm. yeah, he doesn't have the like. Harvey Corman and B. Arthur both do angry very well. Yeah, you know, and uh, although I could see Betty White maybe being coming off as too uh, maybe innocent to play Sybil, which we'll get into in a minute. Um, obviously, if you have not seen this show and you're interested, maybe peace out and uh, go watch it because we're gonna we're gonna. Try not to spoil everything, but we are going to talk about the show, so inherently there will be spoilers. But also, it's been out yeah. since 1974, so, you know, get your shit also, together. <laughs> I think there's there's nothing that we can say that would spoil it. Like, we can walk you through every joke and every bit mm-hmm. and every story point of every episode, mm-hmm. and you would still watch it and be like, oh my god, this is absolutely hilarious. Agreed. You wouldn't be like, oh, they ruined it for me. So the show was based on a real hotel that the Pythons had stayed on uh, when they were shooting on location. Um, that And, and uh, John Cleese and his then-wife, Connie Booth, who is a co-writer of the show and a co-star of the show, stayed on because they were so enamored with what an asshole the, um, the actual proprietor of this hotel uh, called the Glen Eagles. And the guy's name was uh, Donald Sinclair. My little prompt sheet tells me, and they stayed on to study him, and basically just uh, <laughs> apparently the people who uh, knew Do- the actual Donald Sinclair, including his daughter, had said, "Yep, that's Dad." <laughs> and it's a it's a hotel owner who uh, cannot stand his customers. Um, yeah, we'll get it. We'll get into the individual characters, but like, uh, he's he's. There's a lot of material there, obviously, because they were able to do two seasons of a television show based upon a hotel <laughs> so stay. I did. Uh, I did some further research last night, and I was watching some interviews with John Cleese, mm-hmm. and he was telling some stories about Donald Sinclair. And one of the things he said is, when the Pythons were staying there, uh, they were supposed to go out for lunch or something like that, and Eric Idle put his suitcase by the door, mm-hmm. and. Um, and then they got distracted, or it, it rained, and they never left, or something happened. But Eric Idle remembered he had left his suitcase down by the door, so he went down t- to get it, and it was just gone. And so he goes and he asks the guy, he's like, where did you put my suitcase? And the guy's like, oh, I put it way, way, way over there on the other side of that outside wall. And he like went outside and around the building, and there was like way off in the distance was this wall. And he's like, you put it on the other side of that wall? Why did you put my suitcase all the way out there? And the guy was like, oh, well, I thought it might be a bomb. It's a bomb scare. And, uh, <laughs> yeah. And, uh, you know, Cleese was saying this was like 1969. Like it was like, you know, there hadn't really been like – IRA activity in the area, like or like mm-hmm. the sort of like terrorism that we think of today. Yeah. 
Uh, and so when they asked him why he thought it might be a bomb, he said he had fired some employees recently. <laughs> <laughs> so, <laughs> this guy was actually afraid his ex-employees were going to blow up his hotel. <laughs> yeah. That's indicative of, of the, the kind of employer he probably was, right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so when this came out, it was met with mixed reviews because uh, John Cleese, um, who I'm just going to go ahead and say is the Paul McCartney of comedy. How about that? Um, oh, I, yeah, go for it. Who left Pipe, behind that. Python, who would be the Beatles of comedy. And, mm-hmm. uh, you know, obviously the, uh, that sketch comedy, it was like incredibly creative and like – obtuse and not ran i mean yes random but like this i mean this is really thought provoking uh it ranged from thought provoking to just fart jokes so they kind of <laughs> ran the gamut there but like i think when um it was kind of like viewed when when they started the sitcom or when cleese started the sitcom because he left the pythons a year before the show was put to rest so um, this was his next project. It was kind of met with uh, mixed reviews because I, I think a lot of people felt that a, a sitcom was below John Cleese. You know, they just wanted to see him some, in something a little more creative and a little more random, maybe. Or they, you know, what people just like what they know. So change makes them uncomfortable. Uh, so some reviewers uh, slandered the show, but most people love the show, and it's highly regarded. Um, on many lists as, like, if not the number one comedy, but one of the top comedies of all time. John Cleese's character is often re- regarded as one of the best in comedy. His performance and everyone else's performance in the show are regarded as some of the best comedic performances. And, uh, yeah, like, and there's many, many people who um, are just, you know, giants of comedy who will, you know, Wikipedia, you know, they, they'll, they you know, huge names in comedy will reference Faulty Towers as a huge influence and, ex- and an example of how to do it right and also get out while you're on top because mm-hmm. they only did the two seasons. Or as they call them in England, series. Yes. Well, <laughs> another one of the many things that British people <laughs> use the wrong word for. Yeah, if only they could learn how to speak English. Speak American, for crying out loud. (laughs) (laughs) So do you want to get into uh, kind of an episode by episode, um, you know, Uh, walkthrough, which will also give us an opportunity to kind of talk about each of the individual characters and what makes this show. um, I think Zach and I, you and I agree that we agree that this is one of the best, if not the best situation. Absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's in, you know, it's. In my top five, if not at the top of my top mm-hmm. five. So, mm-hmm. um, oh, I guess the yeah, I think you mentioned that Connie Booth and John Cleese were married. I did uh, initially, yeah. And uh, so the first season came out in 1975. By 1979, when the second season came out, they were no longer married, but mm-hmm. still collaborating on the funniest show ever. Yeah, um, and they didn't they didn't dial and, it in. They really nailed it. The second season is not a step down in quality by any stretch. Not at all. No. Um, and also, I think uh, you had mentioned that the directors involved in it were uh, veterans of Monty Python and Mr. Bean and some of those other uh, really popular British shows. Yeah, so they, I mean... They had a top-notch crew as well. Yeah, I didn't... I I only mentioned that to you conversationally, but uh, yeah, one of the directors kind of came from Python, and the other one mm-hmm. went on to, as you said, direct Mr. Bean, but also absolutely fabulous. So like, you know, giant, you know, obviously... They know they know what time it is when it comes to the funny. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. And I guess, uh, and that's just one final point before I get into it. Oh uh, God! Thing that just, can I we saw. just get on with it? No. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have. It's Ooh, not like, dude. Like, this is a. We don't have all the time in the world to just sit here and talk about this. This is a podcast. Come on. <laughs> yeah. Come on. This is meaningful. Uh, another thing that Cleese mentioned in that interview was uh, how brisk the editing is in that show, which didn't actually like doesn't actually strike me. I didn't pay attention to it as closely when I was watching it, I guess because you're too busy laughing at everything. Mm-hmm. But, you know, he was talking about how it was performed in front of a live audience, mm-hmm. or at least all the indoor scenes are. Um, but they were very aware during the editing process and the performing process that they were doing it for television. Mm-hmm. So he was saying that, you know, a lot of times in front of a live audience, you do a joke and the audience laughs and you kind of need to wait 
for the laughter to die down mm -hmm. before you go on with the next bit. Mm -hmm. And he was like, you know, we knew we had boom mics ahead of us. So he's like, even if the audience was laughing at the previous joke, mm -hmm. we would go right into the next one, mm -hmm. knowing that the mic would pick it up and the television audience would catch mm -hmm. it. Um, and yeah, it's one of those things that like, I didn't watch this and be like, oh my God, the editing is so fast. Mm -hmm. But it makes sense having heard him say that. I'm like, oh yeah, it's just like joke, 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 joke. Yeah. It's like nonstop. Yeah, and that's that's like a, kind of like a thing now, but at the time was, was new. And they also... Mm -hmm. uh, I, I believe I read that they took like six months to write each episode. And then before they'd tape it, they'd have weeks of rehearsals on each episode just to mm -hmm. get all the blocking right. Because it, physical comedy, it's a perfect blend of, of you know, of the written word and, and you know, a well-scripted comedy and physical comedy. It's both. And it's, a, mm -hmm. and it's amazing at both. So season one, episode season one. Season one. Yes, all uh, all titled retroactively. That's right. Um, the first episode is now known as A Touch of Class, mm -hmm. in which Basil attempts to attract a high-class clientele to his terrible hotel by placing an expensive ad in a travel magazine. Mm -hmm. And he <laughs> attracts a certain Lord Mabry, who he caters to every whim of while completely dismissing all his other guests as riffraff and being below him. Mm -hmm. And, of course, uh, spoiler alert, uh, Lord Mabry is... Uh, <laughs> exposed as a con artist by the end of the episode. Or as the British call them, a confidence trickster. That's right, a confidence trickster. Right. Darn. <laughs> Which is a much cooler word or thing to call somebody. To heck with those confidence yeah. tricksters, I say. <laughs> yeah, um, and I say that as well. Yes, yeah, th so th this episode we have discussed privately uh, that uh, mm -hmm. it introduces every character um, completely. It, you mm -hmm. know, you know exactly who you're dealing with in your in your four main characters in this show. One is that uh, obviously Basil Fawlty, who is a terrible person. He is a social climber, as you said. Like with with Lord Mabry, uh, he'll just ignore everyone else and and just kiss this guy's ass because he thinks it'll he he feels that this is the client level of clientele that he deserves at his hotel. And he'll mm -hmm. stop at nothing to climb the social ladder and then just put down the second you, he feels that you are not of use to him in this endeavor, then it is done. <laughs> he'll, he'll just go yeah. back to berating you. <laughs> um, his wife, Sybil, is, although she gets less screen time, is just as much of an asshole as Basil. And... She is always like barking orders at him. I mean, don't don't get me wrong. You you kind of don't feel bad for him because he just is such a jerk. But she's always <laughs> like barking orders at him, like all this stuff. He's like just just sabotaging him, putting him down, and then also additionally not often contributing to the the work at hand of running the hotel. O oftentimes <laughs> talking on the phone. And one of the show's taglines, you know, is she'll say, "Oh, I know." Oh, I know. It's like the line, one of one of the two lines most uttered in the show. And she's on the phone with somebody or she'll be like talking a guest's ear off that really just doesn't want to be talking and just wants to sit and yeah. enjoy their dinner or whatever. Um, I think uh, Andrea is her phone friend that we never actually see. Right. I think that's her name, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, actually, yeah. I think you yeah. might see her in one episode. Um, oh, yes, I think yeah, you know you're talking yeah. about. Um, and then... Additionally, uh, out of the big four in the show, there's Polly, who is played by Connie Booth, who at the time was John Cleese's wife. And she's a, a, a young chambermaid who's putting, I think she's putting herself through school, like art school or something. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, and then there's Manuel, who is the only purely good character <laughs> in the whole cast. <laughs> and he is trodden upon uh mercilessly by not only basil but guests alike because he he's a he's a bellhop he's from barcelona he has an extremely limited um understanding of the english language and basil knows even less spanish though he claims at one point <laughs> that he he learned quote classical spanish and not that what whatever what do you refer to it as like 
I can't remember the word he uses, but not, yeah, yeah, he puts it down like somehow he's better at Spanish. Not, than, not that mumbling dialect that he picked Spain. up or something like that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> he's from Barcelona. So, yeah, so that, that sets the stage. Like, uh, Basil blames everything on on Manuel. He takes everything out on Manuel because he can't take it out on his wife because he, he very rarely, but only but once in, in the series, stands up to her. Rather, uh, instead of uh, confronting her or addressing any of the issues, he, he mutters brilliant insults under his breath as she walks away, which is also <laughs> like one of John Cleese's superpowers. He refers to her variously as, yes, my little nest of vipers, or uh, uh, my, my little piranha fish, or um, at one point refers to her laugh, which is, which is kind of like a, ha, 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 ha. he says it sounds like somebody's machine gunning a seal. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's right, because she always like does the. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's his wife, so yeah. they have a great relationship. Although she 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 like doesn't, you know, like she barks orders at him, and you get the feeling that he's terrified of her. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then, yeah, he'll he'll throw insults at her under his breath. And it's like she hears it, but she doesn't care. Yeah. She's just like, just do what I yeah, told whatever. you to do. And he takes it out on everybody else. Everybody else. else. <laughs> Guests yeah. included, but especially Manuel. Uh, but Polly mm-hmm. is kind of important in this because she actually does speak some uh, Spanish and can communicate mm-hmm. with Manuel and has sympathy for him and tries her best to protect him from uh, Basil's tirades and yelling i think in that even first episode one of the guests uh comes in and speaks spanish and manuel knows exactly you know it's it's like they they establish very early on that you know even though manuel is is takes the brunt of everybody's aggression Mm -hmm. it's not his fault it's you know they point out that basil is cheap for not hiring somebody who can speak english nor or uh investing any money and teaching him how to speak english and just instead pretending that he knows how uh, but then, yeah, Polly can speak to Manuel in Spanish, and he's he's good to go. One of the guests comes in and speaks in Spanish, and he's good to go. So it's really like, yeah, it definitely just highlights that, okay, this guy, <laughs> Basil Fawlty, is uh, yeah not doing anything to help Manuel's situation and then blaming everything on him. Yeah, even though Manuel's the brunt of, of Basil's abuse, um, Basil's the brunt of the joke. Yeah. Because he's just objectively a terrible person which john cleese has stated many times that he you know, he wrote he and uh, connie booth wrote basil as just a terrible person with like barely if any redeeming qualities at all <laughs> he's, he's a liar every 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 scenario that we're about to speak about is a direct result it's like he is the architect of his own failure there are so many opportunities for him not like you know when you're watching curb your enthusiasm and all larry david has to do is not say that <laughs> you know <laughs> yeah, that would have yeah, been the solution exactly. to this it, this is like he just is he's it's cover up after cover up and dishonesty after dishonesty posturing and it just it always ends as i've said before in just like this ballet of cacophony and and most almost every show is like comes to a close with just like every, a parade of all these things like going wrong, like all all of the snares that that, that Basil has set on himself for himself, <laughs> yeah. you know, they all come undone in this beautiful moment at the end, and then roll credits. So the first one, a touch of class, um, does a good job, kind of setting the stage for everything, and you, and you kind of you know he Lord Mabry writes checks, cashes checks in the hotel, he. I think he somebody has a vintage coin collection which he offers to get appraised because he's going to the coin store and, and of course like Basil just hands it over because he's just blindly trusting this guy because he's a lord. Um, but then there's also a uh, there's also a uh, uh, an investigator or something a detective uh, staying at the yeah. hotel as well who is investigating Lord Maybury. And of course, he's wearing a leather jacket and has a Cockney accent, so Basil just completely dismisses him as part of the riffraff. Yeah, berates him. <laughs> Is beneath him. The kind of riffraff we're getting here. <laughs> uh, the second episode. Uh, oh, also, go ahead. I'm sorry. Oh, I was going to say, just also this episode, obviously being the first episode, introduces us to a running gag throughout the series, which is uh, the exterior shot, right. which shows the Faulty Towers sign. Mm-hmm. 
And of course, in this first episode, just the S of Towers is hanging off, yep. which even before you're introduced to the characters or scenarios, you already get the feeling like, okay, this place is a little bit shot. Yes, like, yes. The, it is, the letters are falling off their side. It is a great visual representation <laughs> of the, the shoddiness of the hotel and like what lies inside. And then at each episode, it changes a bit more and more. And then a, a, a few episodes in, you are... <laughs> You are cued in to, they have a quick shot of the paper boy who is now not just wrecking the sign, but rearranging the letters uh, to be these, you know, occasionally filthy anagrams. Um, <laughs> farty owls is one, you know, flowery twats <laughs> yeah. is one. Uh, yeah. Flayed otters, is that one? Uh, yes, I think so. <laughs> <laughs> That's so gross. But uh, yeah, so I mean, it also speaks to like, of, of, of it's so well written that of, of course the paper boy is is screwing up the sign because like Basil's probably a shitty tipper. He's probably like mean to the kid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. Good call on that one. That that is a fun thing to watch. And, it, and it's also the first. It's it kicks off every episode, which is kind of like a, you know, almost in like in the same way that when the Marvel movies like ha- they always have like an end scene at the end that you you know you have to stick around for like you know what the episode yeah. of Faulty Towers you're gonna look forward to whatever the hell the sign says. <laughs> This week, um, yeah. So I was I was jumping into episode two is the builders, and this this leans into his um, both uh, Sybil's demanding nature of Basil and unwillingness to actually handle anything. So while she's away, she wants a certain uh, thing fixed in the lobby of the hotel, and uh, uh, Basil, being cheap, hires uh, the the contractors that already haven't finished the wall on the property some years before. <laughs> Because he just wants to save a buck, and not only do they they do uh, a bad job, but they do the completely wrong job, and they remove they remove the <laughs> entrance to the dining room, <laughs> and additionally, uh, don't put in the door to the kitchen, which is what they asked actually asked for. <laughs> so yeah. now there's just no access to to their uh, uh, dining facility. I think. Except, oh, maybe they do do the door, but yeah, it's just... The, oh, they put the door in front of the stairway. That's right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Which I don't maybe like to talk about it seems ridiculous, but it's just like the way they deal with it and the way like every time like Basil gets aggravated with somebody, which is often... Um, he'll just like walk away with his, his fist just clenched and he's just walking under his breath, just yeah. hurling They insults. also, uh, in, in the first episode, they hinted at the two building companies. Uh, there's a scene in the first one, in the first one, sorry, where, uh, Basil is on the phone and he's complaining about, you know, when I asked you to build a wall, I wanted a wall, not just a pile of bricks in the garden. <laughs> right. And then Sybil walks out and he pretends he's talking to somebody else. Right. And then when she goes in, he's like, oh, she wanted me to call Stubbs, not you, O'Reilly, or whatever. Mm -hmm. And so episode two, of course, Sybil's like, don't forget to call Stubbs to work on the uh, dining room or whatever, the remodel. Mm -hmm. And of course, he calls O'Reilly again. Right. Right. (laughs) And then she wants him to call Stubbs to fix their mistake. Right. And of course, he waits for her to leave and calls O'Reilly again. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Just rather than just like going the easy route. Um, yeah. yeah, so Basil Faulty is incredibly cheap. Uh, yeah, um, and this is also, I think this is the only uh, example of si- uh, Sybil being physically abusive and being abusive towards someone else. Usually, I think in every other episode, she is, everybody else seems to, except for the one guy she annoys later on, everybody else seems to really like Sybil, except she's just so cruel to Basil. Yeah. But in this episode, she beats both Basil and O'Reilly with an umbrella. Yeah. She's so upset at how it went. Yeah. Um, and then also, I think uh, the actress who plays Sybil, uh, her name's Prunella Scales, I believe. That's right. And um, apparently in real life, she is the sweetest, nicest lady and played completely against against type mm-hmm. uh, doing this role. And she is absolutely fabulous at it. Um, much like Susie Essman in Kirby Enthusiasm <laughs> playing, She's... playing Susie Green. I remember the first time I saw uh, Susie Essman it, it not in character it was like at a panel discussion or something for curb your enthusiasm and i was like shocked at how like even just like the tone of her voice and 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 like the meter <laughs> of her her you know speech you know it's like this is i can't believe that you play this this venomous <laughs> woman on yeah. the show. foul mouth oh, she's so cruel she's so cruel to jeff garland <laughs> 
<laughs> uh, that, and, and I'm sure they they probably grabbed that you know that dynamic straight from Faulty Towers. Oh sure, like they had to have. Oh for sure. <laughs> except for Jeff, except for Jeff and Kirby enthusiasm is so sweet. Yep. That you're just like <laughs> every time he's being berated, you can't help but feel bad for him. Dazzle, you're just kind of like this guy's a jerk. He deserves it. <laughs> <laughs> in, in the, not to get too far off topic, but in that same panel discussion. Uh, they were talking about this, you know, the nature of how Curb, Curb was like lightly scripted. Like this show is very, uh, Faulty Towers is heavily scripted. Like yeah. everything's accounted for, but like, uh, you know, Curb is more like setting up scenarios and just kind of letting the actors, you know, there's key points they have to hit. And there's one scene that they're they're trying to get right. And I guess Larry just went over to Susie and said, uh, um, call Jeff a fat fuck. And she's like, no, it hurt his feelings. He's like, he's not, it's fine, it's fine, just do it. And apparently she did it in the scene, in character, you know, it's just like so, it's so mm-hmm. pronounced when she, she does it. And I guess on set, Jeff's mouth was just like on the floor. Like, what? <laughs> But, but he loved it so much like they like it ruined the take you know because like because yeah. <laughs> it was just he came out of left field <laughs> it's so mean <laughs> all right all right all right so yeah the builders right. um yeah um yeah uh that parlays into the wedding party which is episode three um and this is an example of uh how basil will uh, force his conservative values onto anybody, <laughs> regardless of whether it's appropriate <laughs> yeah, or not. Okay. And there's a, an engaged couple uh, and the groom's parents, uh, all of whom are friends of Polly's, which he finds out later, uh, come to stay in the hotel. And Basil imposes his conservative beliefs on the couple and refuses to let them get a room together. He makes them stay in separate rooms, even though they're engaged they're there to be married but they're not married <laughs> and uh this is also introduces basil's uh one of his uh character traits which is consistent throughout the duration <laughs> is that he will just burst into people's rooms and sometimes he's, do- he's sometimes he's doing it to catch something that's not happening in the room sometimes he's in, it's, sometimes it's actually quite innocent why he ends up in there he, sometimes he ends up in the I, wrong I think in this episode it's mostly innocent right. but he's still just Walks in on an yeah for sure you know, you know like, and then he, uh, so what he's seeing from his because he is uh, there, there's a lot of like you know mistaken identity in situations not not with people but like so he he's assuming that they're like swinging young couple you know London couple or whatever so they're having like, some wild sex party at his hotel and he's like you know hell bent to like catch him at it and kick him out you know and so yeah. like you know he sees all these hugs going on like various people open the door and the 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 the, 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 the old man. Uh, older fella is like hugging, you know, the the bride, and then all of a sudden he's hugging Polly, and then you know Polly's like in her underwear, putting because she's actually trying on her friend's wedding dress, like because they're just hanging out, like being friends. But in Basil's mind, it's just like he's constructing this like, you know, uh, wild party that is just just really grates his conservative values. <laughs> yeah, uh, and I think uh, yeah, this one also just kind of shows. Uh, you know, and Basil is won't let the couple room together. Mm-hmm. And they want a joined room, and he won't let. He's like, "Oh no, I think we've got rooms on two separate right, floors." Right. <laughs> like, uh, but Sybil comes in, and she's like, "I'll handle this. Don't worry, Basil." And uh, I think it's one of the the first examples we get of Sybil actually being good with customers when she, right. well, you know, when she decides to to do something. Well, the two of them, she's the only one that's good with the customers, yeah. ever, except for when ever. Yeah. Basil thinks that somebody's upper crust and even then he ends up overcompensating and just making everything super awkward by trying to place himself in the lexicon of the upper crust which he is not part of <laughs> yeah. uh, so in uh you know exemplifying basil's uh sucking up to customers which he think can uh further his his career or the uh, status of his hotel mm-hmm. we have uh the next episode oh, yeah. which is the hotel inspectors mm-hmm. Which uh, Basil catches wind that there are uh, hotel inspectors, or uh, I guess maybe they're reviewers for a magazine, but supposedly there's three of them in town. And uh, so, of course, he keeps trying to, you know, surmise which one, which right. guest is the, the hotel inspector. He's looking inspector. for the groups of three or just trying to figure out who. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And uh, yeah, at one point, somebody says, you know, in my profession, I stay at lots of hotels. And he's like, your profession, you say? Yeah. 
<laughs> and so, mm. of course, he starts catering to this guy's, you know, everything the guy wants and overcompensating, as you said, uh, until, of course, he realizes that, wait, maybe it's not this guy. Right. And then he pulls a complete 180 <laughs> and treats the guy like dirt. In front of the actual inspectors. <laughs> yeah. Right. So they like, yeah, it always ba- this is another mistaken identity where it does involve people with him. He's always misidentifying and just in his desperate attempt to socially climb, he misidentifies who he feels like he should direct his completely <laughs> unnatural kindness towards. Yeah. And that guy that you think and it kind of plays like, you know, as, as an audience member, you're like, oh, that must be the hotel inspector because of they, how they present. They're just very, very buttoned yeah. down and very proper. <laughs> he also has like this really... uh peculiar like speech pattern yes which makes him seem like kind of upper crust but also at the same time like he might just be talking nonsense that's right <laughs> that's right and it turns out he's just talking nonsense he's just like a, a painfully needy guest <laughs> yeah which is like uh sort of the introduction to the obnoxious guest element of the show yes where it's like you think our main characters are bad <laughs> there's these guests that are even yeah, worse which beautifully comes into play like <laughs> especially in some later episodes which i'm looking forward yeah. to getting to <laughs> um and uh in keeping with him trying to to uh um maintain appearances or 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 not maintain but even like uh alter his appearances um despite having a terrible terrible kitchen facility like bad food storage <laughs> um practices there's you know rotten food food that's been dropped on the floor sent out to customers like uh, animals in the kitchen um at one at one point uh there's a there's a uh, dead body kept in a prep area uh <laughs> gourmet night uh is an episode wherein he decides that he wants to throw this gourmet night party you know dinner party to attract a higher clientele a higher level clientele, the, the clientele that he feels like he deserves. And they bring on this chef who they allude earlier, like in some sort of toast, like here's to tonight's dinner. And the chef's like, oh, no, no, no. Like, I, you know, I, he, basically you, you're, you're led to believe that he uh, might have a problem with the sauce. And so he turns that down. And then he's also being um, uh, re- remarkably kind to Manuel. <laughs> and just is really <laughs> taking a shine to Manuel. Um and uh, his uh, his intentions aren't made clear until it's dinner time, and then the chef is blackout drunk, like just can't walk, can't stand up, and you learn that it is because uh, he actually was in love with Manuel, and Manuel rejected his advances, and he's just so broken heart about it because you know because Manuel he's so he's so sweet, <laughs> you know, which he is, <laughs> and um. Yes. Yeah, and it's like everything you said. Yeah, you, one could see how one would fall for Manuel, um, and yeah. So now they have this dinner party with you know the upper crusty people that Basil so desperately wants in the hotel, and they have no chef and nobody on staff except for Sybil can really cook, but like mm-hmm. she also just just doesn't help sometimes. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um. Yeah, so like, as you can imagine, like everything about the service goes wrong. Um, and one of the things that they do play and do, which is, it is really funny often, is that like just simply because Manuel doesn't understand what Basil's saying, and off and many times what the guests are saying, like he'll he'll be providing a service that no one asked for, or like remove plates that people don't want removed, or just there's just all <laughs> sorts of all manner of like misunderstanding comedy that, that goes on with. Uh, with Manuel and yeah. So this, this ends up with a, because the chef is down, like they, people already have the menus and then they have to like tell people like, Oh no, the menu's changed. <laughs> Even though it's a specific dinner. And then he ends up going to a, a, a neighboring restaurant. His friend Andre provides him with a duck. He brings the duck back, some great physical comedy door opens, duck flies through the air, duck la- ends up somehow on Manuel's foot. <laughs> <laughs> and then you know and then i forget what oh 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 if it, it reaches its ultimate demise and i think up until that point they're still considering it for service uh but it isn't until the drunken chef vomits on it that they decided that they they had to go get a new duck and so they they go to 
uh, goes back to Andre, and of course it's like like the fancy silver service tray with the cover, and you know, and Andre's like, "Here's your duck, Mister Faulty." And then while he's not looking, uh, another employee comes in and grabs that one and leaves it an identical thing, you know, which we haven't opened. But the second that happens, you just know there's so many things that happen in the show. It's like, oh, here we go. <laughs> like, you know, yeah. you know? And he gets back to finally serve everyone. Everyone's like been waiting for like hours for their food and everything they've gotten has been terrible. The drinks are wrong. And I think at this point, Polly and Manuel are singing to them <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> just to entertain them. And he opens up and, you know, he of course has to present at this point, he's like all sweaty and his comb over is like sticking to his forehead and his, his the back of his hair is all wet and just, he just looks awful. His tie is just a mess. And he opens it up to reveal a cake and instead of just like <laughs> accepting that it's a cake, he digs the cake apart, like as if the duck is going to be inside. Yeah. And, the, and then offers the cake to people. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. So I think the, the first episode uh, established Polly as an artist. And I think what they were celebrating was that she sold her first uh, her first drawing or painting or whatever. Right. And it turns out what she had sold was a picture of Manuel to the show. That's chef. right. That's right. That's why I well remembered. <laughs> yeah. But, yeah. but, but, but uh, then a, also, a picture which everyone, everyone but, agrees is Manuel except for Basil can't see it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, he can't see it. <laughs> I think it doesn't uh doesn't Sybil even say like she wants a picture of Manuel too or something, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> something like that. Everybody likes <laughs> Oh man. It also like kind of highlights how uh complicit uh Polly can be in Basil schemes. Yes. And in this one, even Sybil is complicit. Like not one of them is like, hey, maybe we cancel the dinner and reschedule. reschedule. Yeah. <laughs> They're like, no, we can pull this off. Let's yeah, do it. Yeah, this show, the, the easy solution never happens. You know, it, it just <laughs> never happens. Everything that happens in the show is the most difficult. It can be down to like answering the phones. Like people who are standing <laughs> by ringing phones will wait for somebody to come across the hotel to answer it. Everything about it is just like a, a, a next level irritation. Everything. And so by the end of the show, it's just like, oh, my fucking god you're just like you have your face in your like i'll pull my hat down like i i can watch like like when i was a kid i used to watch a lot of horror movies right and like i can watch Mm -hmm. a horror movie like not like the super disturbing ones that are just meant to like actually like you know disturb your mind and like make you not sleep but like thing like freddy krueger like your your saws and your human yeah that shit yeah i'm all set or there's even some like uh psychologically terrifying ones i know i'm not gonna watch like the witch or midsummer, I'm like I've I've heard I've heard that they're absolutely terrifying, and I'm good. I'm just good. But uh, but like <laughs> like I'm I've never been afraid of like Jason Voorhees or Freddy Krueger or, or Michael Myers, right? Like that that shit to me is just not scary. What's terrifying to me <laughs> are shows like Faulty Towers and Curb Your Enthusiasm and movies like Meet the Parents, like where it's just like this comedy that's just like make it stop. This is insufferable, and this show is. <laughs> yeah. the, the best at it i mean they're the f- they do a, a great job like making you anticipate the the things that are gonna yes. happen to like you know like that episode in particular like is i think the only episode where a significant portion of it takes place outside of the hotel right. and uh you know they indicate at the beginning his car's having trouble right. so you know that's gonna come into play later yep. you're just waiting for it and then same thing when the uh when the trays get switched you're like oh no <laughs> like what is this gonna be that's right and of course there's like a million jokes in between you know that setup and then that payoff. Yeah, I mean, th- there's there's no wasted details. It's it's worth paying attention to everything because everything sets up, you know, the next joke. And even paying attention to the tiniest details because there's always like a little bit of there, there's even like subtext jokes that are that that, that will go along like series wide. That's the other thing about this series. Like, I mean, you can watch it in order because why wouldn't you? Because it's kind of fun to see how they intended it to be rolled out. But you could start with the last episode and be just as informed as if you start yeah. with the first episode, right? Um, so the one of the more famous uh, episodes, and I think that you were you alluded to some of the imagery um, that you saw before you had seen the show itself, mm-hmm. um, probably came from this next episode, which is one of the most popular for a number of reasons, and it's also one of the most infamous uh, for some reasons that we'll get into in a bit. It's called the Germans, and uh, it's a 
we're still in uh, post World War II England, but it's been thirty years. So like a lot of people have moved on, but like a lot of like the older generation, like Basil, and uh, the major who stays, he's one of the permanent residents of the hotel, who's just like this senile old uh, racist <laughs> guy uh, who lives there. <laughs> Gen- like generally harmless, like you know, in the day to day, but like you could tell, like. You know, he makes it. He yeah, makes most, it, mostly unaware of what's happening around. That's right, him. I mean, right. Like but then how they play but him. But he does yeah. make it clear how he feels about things. You're like, oh shit, like that's not. Um, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah, and it's shocking when he does because he's usually just asking for a sherry or the paper. He's like kind of like this drunk old <laughs> buffoon. Um, so it kind of plays into like how like the con- some of the country is still not at rest with uh, you know the the war. And they're not quite ready to welcome German tourists into their lives. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so this, this deals with a, uh, a group of German guests staying at the hotel. And um, Sybil is in the hospital <laughs> with an ingrown toenail <laughs> for surgery. <laughs> and uh, leaving, of course, Basil to tend to the hotel, which she does not trust him to do. Um, and... You know, one of the things that he's charged with doing is hanging this mangy moose head, like, you know, taxidermy <laughs> moose head, um, that he keeps trying to put up and is in the process of finally hanging and is interrupted repeatedly by Sybil calling to see if he's doing it yet, <laughs> you know, <laughs> which enrages him more and more. And there's even this one amazing scene too, uh, involving Manuel and 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 the uh, the major, who's uh, we've outlined as like a kind of a batty old fella, and uh, the the moose head is um, like Basil like leaves Manuel at the desk to kind of like tidy up and watch after while he goes to get something, and so he's actually saying one of my favorite lines from the show uh, by Andrew Sachs who plays Manuel is uh, he's practicing his English, which he's learned. <laughs> he says this, which I say, <laughs> sometimes it just pops into my head like a song. He's saying, uh, I I speak English very well. I've learned it from a book. <laughs> but he <laughs> keeps saying it, and he's ducking down and tidying under the desk, but there's the moose head there. <laughs> and so the major thinks that the moose head is talking to him in this, like, strangely broken English. <laughs> oh, man. I, 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 it's not like a major plot point or anything, but it's just like, I don't know why it just like, always sticks in my head. It's, it's so funny. It kind of highlights the uh, the major's cluelessness. Yeah. I mean, if you weren't already aware of how clueless he is, like, he actually thinks a moose is talking to him. That's right. And, and, it, and, it, further, and it further outlines that Manuel is trying his best to, like, make it work. He really is. <laughs> yeah. That he's learning from a he's, book because Basil won't pay for English right. lessons. From, or, from like, a book. <laughs> <laughs> and uh yeah uh, also there's like the the sort of a re- uh, reoccurring gag from the first mm-hmm. episode where he, basil was trying to hang That's a painting right. and every time he got over to around to doing it sybil would call him or come in to make sure he was doing make it. him yeah You'd have to put it make down. him walk across the hotel to answer the phone even though she's right next to it. you know would you get that basil yeah. <laughs> you know but yeah so yeah. It, it ends up it results in um so the german guests are staying there and uh, um, should we should we get to the the uh, the the filthy bit now, or should we? Do you want to like kind of recap with, with that? Let's recap with that. Let's just let's get through the episode first. Is that fair? Sure. Yeah, yeah okay. that's fair. So Basil um, ends up, of course, through some you know uh, comedic timing setups. The the moose head. <laughs> Knocks. He ends up getting like thrice struck in the head and concussed, and he then ends up in the hospital, like with a classic like bandage around his head. Like that's a thing. <laughs> like it's like his head was coming apart. I don't know. And uh, um, he is faced with a doctor who who is also Sybil's doctor, who is a person mm-hmm. of color, and this comes into play later. So let's just let's talk about all that all at once, and then. Um, yeah, so he he of course like leaves defies the doctor's orders, leaves the hotel, ends or leaves the hospital, sorry, ends up back at the hotel and then insists upon serving the German guests 
who he's really trying to like put on his game face for, but because his his already fractured brain is even more fractured by his concussion, he keeps <laughs> reminding people like in the loud like whisper like don't mention the war like which is like just audible. <laughs> Uh, and I think I mentioned it once, but I got away with true. it. <laughs> yes, I don't okay. think you did. And he just keeps like he keeps. It's almost like uh, it's where Austin Powers stole like the mole, 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 mole joke from. Uh, you know, he just of course is just every time he he's just like instead of saying the word he means to say, he's saying a war, or you know, it's just in it, you know the, one of the guests ends up in tears, and then it's just and they're just begging him to please stop. We're just trying to like have dinner, and he's just like it's escalating more and more, and it, it results in him. And this is the famous scene of him with his uh, finger as a mustache under his known nose, like uh, goose stepping like a clown through the dining room and out into the lobby and back into the dining room. And then, you know, and then of course, like, yeah, the, the episode ends, yeah. you know, because how could you do better than that? I love uh, when he's taking the order at the table and he's like, would you like hors d'oeuvres? Mm-hmm. Hors d'oeuvres? Mm-hmm. Hors d'oeuvres, which must be followed, or which must be obeyed at hors all times. <laughs> yeah, that's right. He keeps like, he keeps just breaking into like, a, like the role, uh, like the, the barking German commandant. <laughs> yeah. Oh God! It's just like it's just like oh it's stop so... stop stop! And the poor people are so uncomfortable. Um, I wonder if that like watching that episode like as a German. I wonder if it's like funny and cathartic, or if it's just like ugh, yeah, like we don't feel great about that. <laughs> yeah, you know. So, so you and I had uh, already tossed around the idea of reviewing Faulty Towers, mm-hmm. and maybe even the same day that we had talked about this it. This is true. Uh, I. I I signed on to the uh, awful platform that's absolutely terrible, Facebook, oh. and uh, saw a post from Terry Gilliam that was in reference to Faulty Towers, and he was basically just like you know calling out the the whatever the socially correct police or yeah, whatever, yeah, yeah. <laughs> whatever you want to call yeah. them. And at first, I, I didn't even understand the tone of his thing because it was like two paragraphs. Mm-hmm. And then by the end of it, I was like, oh, I get it. Like, apparently they've removed this episode of Faulty Towers for some reason, and Terry Gilliam is not psyched about that. Um, And so I looked into it, and it turned out that the episode that was removed was, this is probably, as you said at the beginning of, you know, our wrap-up of this episode, that this is probably the most iconic episode of the show. And it is the one that was pulled from streaming services, um, and for a couple reasons. One of them being, as you pointed out, that the doctor is a person of color. And, of course, Basil being an asshole who can't wrap his head around that when he leaves the hospital. Or, yeah, he's about to leave the hospital at the beginning when Sybil is in there. And he walks out into the hallway and the doctor's on his way in. And Basil just has this moment of shock. Like, yeah, like oh, look, a black well, doctor. He, like, leaps back yeah. like like he's going to be attacked or something. Yeah. yeah. Um, so there was that was cited as one of the reasons, and then the other reason that was cited was <laughs> so uh, with all of Basil's faults, he's definitely a you know he definitely shows sexism here and there, but that's not like one of like his default things is just a sexist True. guy. But for some reason, whenever he's interacting with the major, he's always complaining about his wife in like this like sexist derogatory way. And of course, that's exactly what he's doing when Major first comes on screen. He's complaining about her being in the hospital and needing the surgery on her toe. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and uh, of course, this sets the Major off on this rant about this girl that he once liked. And then he gets completely off topic. Or Well, it starts out, he's talking about going to a, like a, a soccer or, as the English call it, a football game um, with this girl. And then that turns into his like describing the teams and the players on mm-hmm. the teams. And he's, I think he says something about like, the West Indies teams. Mm-hmm. And then he starts talking about, like, he calls them all the Mm N-word. And, you know, like, is working with these, like, different distinctions of when the N-word is appropriate. Um, And so, apparently, that when this, sometime in, like, the 90s or early 2000s, the N-word was was edited out of that speech. Yeah, like, that that, uh, that whole, I mean, the N-word isn't the only uh, derogatory racial uh, slur used in that episode. In fact, it's, it's... Probably like many uh, against the Germans, you know. Um, yeah, but yeah. Absolutely. So the the version that you and I watched initially just didn't have that whole sequence in it, really at all, or at least mm-hmm. not that part. Yeah, it was cut way down. Because like, I I remember that interaction, but I didn't have any memories of of that language being right. used. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, and apparently that it was edited initially with the blessing of John Cleese and Connie That's Booth, right. um, but. When it was put on streaming services, 
recently they just put it up as it originally aired so that speech was back in in its regular Mm -hmm. place um and yeah that that led to them deciding they should pull it down but of course terry gilliam wasn't happy with that Mm. and as you and i discussed uh when we first read about it it's like it's offensive yes yes but it's also very much in character with the characters that are delivering it and you know we've already seen that the the major is like you know a, a, a relic of a different age we have no idea what what veteran he's mm-hmm. a you know what war he fought in um yeah he, he thinks a moose is talking to him so he's clearly not all there mentally he probably did you know he's a, he's probably grew up in a time where he used those terminology those words yeah frequently that's probably just part of who he used to be and it's still in his head mm-hmm. somewhere um and of course like they do highlight that that basil um probably served in the korean war he could be lying since he is a liar but <laughs> multiple times throughout the show he does say that he has you know he keeps saying his leg he says he's got a piece of shrapnel on his leg from the korean mm-hmm. war um so I, I feel like that's probably like he has this respect for the major as being a higher ranking british officer you mm-hmm. know if if basil also had some military um experience mm-hmm. but because he just yeah he he not only like tolerates the major talking like mm-hmm. that he like almost sinks down to his level with him whenever he's talking with him. Yeah. I mean, if, if, if this, if this episode of uh faulty towers is a Thanksgiving dinner, uh, then Basil is playing the asshole dad and, and the major is the racist uncle. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and it's just kind of like, but yeah. Yeah. So, uh, but John Cleese also spoke out, uh, and basically said the same thing that you and I had talked about. Like, we, you know, we are very much aware that that is inappropriate, but that was kind of the point. It's like it highlights the flaws of these characters. Mm-hmm. Um, and he criticized the BBC about how they don't make good shows anymore and they're all just a bunch of, you know, whatever soulless businessmen. Mm-hmm. Uh, but then a couple of days later, the episode was back up streaming yes, again. Yes, and, and by the time I had got back around to it to review, they, they had placed a title card at the beginning which simply stating the truth, which is this episode mm-hmm. contains, um, you know, some roof stoof. Yep. Yeah. And uh yeah, it's it's uncomfortable. Like I mean, I I I don't feel like I have a a, a ton to, to you know, say about it because it just makes me uncomfortable, but it but if I mm-hmm. do agree with the argument that it is contextually appropriate both for the period of time that it takes place in and and considering the the nature of the characters delivering the lines that makes sense. It's not just like out mm-hmm. of the blue, you know. Um, it's not the first time we've gotten a taste that like the major's off a tick, you know. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> Ooh, did you get a call from Oops, your brother? Sorry. here? <laughs> I am, or my dad's getting a call from my brother. I've got his iPad Chris in front of me. Chris Jones. <laughs> yeah. Oh, hang on a sec. <laughs> well, let's talk to Chris. What's up? Hey, Chris. Hi. Hi. So uh, I'm here with Spencer. We're re- recording. Oh, I guess you can't oh. hear him because I've got my headphones I can hear on. him. Okay. Uh, I've got Dad's iPad in front of me while we're recording our podcast, so you're now on the podcast. Say hello. hello. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, with that, I might uh, ask you to call Mom's phone. <laughs> All right, I love you. Bye bye. All right, that's my brother yeah. Chris. Um, okay, one last thought on the Germans, and we should move yes. on. Um, is so the. The black doctor is the only person of color that appears in this whole mm-hmm. series, and uh, if uh, I'm happy that that is the the role they chose for their one person of color, um, and you know rather than having him be like a guy that robs the hotel or something, is which you would probably get an American show in 1975, or 1980, um, <laughs> or 1990, yeah, or, ni- or 2020, <laughs> or in the White House. Uh, yeah, and then and so, but again, it also highlights like you know, like the fact that Basil is shocked to see a black doctor. Mm-hmm. It's like, of course, this guy is like can't handle can't handle that this is the reality. To yeah, and it's also true that he can't he he you know he assumes that if there's a doctor that checks in, it's the male of the of the duo. Like he can't wrap exactly. his head around like that females are doctors. He's just you know he's a he's a really big prick. <laughs> he's period. Yeah. He's not a good guy. And they make no allusions to him being a good guy. So um but that said, I mean it, it, it is a it is a moment in the show. Um it's perhaps exacerbated by his reaction to the doctor as well in that same episode. Um but it also kind of like addresses it. And it, it, it is not the entirety of the show. The show does not hinge 
upon that moment, but though I could understand why um, it would cause some outcry. And I also understand yeah. the argument that it's like it's within context, it is what it is, and that makes sense for the, the characters and, and the story, but still mm. makes me uncomfortable. <laughs> Yes, yeah. absolutely. He, as he laughs nervously and moves to commercial. Um, so we're going to take a break here and we'll uh, do the Bull Moose Minute and we'll come back and we will do a quick rundown of season two, which I'm going to say right now involves one of my favorite, or no, it's my favorite episode of this show. And whereas this show is one of my favorite comedies of all time, it might be my favorite episode of comedic television. We'll be right back. This is your Bull Moose Minute for the week starting on Monday, June 22nd. Earl Sweatshirt, Feet of Clay. This is available on CD and tan vinyl. Also this week, Frank Zappa and the Mothers. Mothers, 1970, a 4-CD box set. Four CDs of previously unreleased studio and live recordings. It's from the Flo and Eddie period. And if you're not familiar with who Flo and Eddie are, they sang backing vocals many a time with... Frank Zappa, as well as T-Rex, and they were members of the band The Turtles. The Turtles have arguably one of the most screwed up legacies in popular music history. Have you ever watched any of the videos of them talking about how their career went? I have not, and I apparently need to. Oh my gosh. It is so... On one hand, like they kind of have like a dismissive approach of it, because they're really super sarcastic guys. But regardless of that, it's just the, the, the sheer amount of uh, the way they, they, just, they just got screwed over repeatedly, <laughs> which is why it's hard to find like turtle stuff that's like issued properly just because like you know, there's several, several labels handling it and, and different managers receiving commissions in perpetuity, that kind of vibe. Almost like a, what's Elvis's guy's name there? Colonel Tom? Uh, yep, Colonel Tom Parker. Yeah, it's kind of that kind of vibe. All of these titles, as well as any book, Record, video game, CD, tchotchke, puppet, socks, board games, DVDs, Blu-rays, or anything else you want that falls under the pop culture, guys. Posters, uh, what else? Uh, box sets, uh, headphones, PlayStations are all available at all Bull Moose locations, which are now reopened for business with some safety guidelines, or at bullmoose.com. And welcome back. And no, you, you do it. <laughs> you do it. And welcome. And oh, no, we're I'm back. sorry. I thought you meant. I thought you were waiting for me to go. Oh no! Uh, one more day. <laughs> and we're back. <laughs> welcome to the. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, You're natural. Yeah. You're crushing this. <laughs> yeah, you got this. And All right. welcome back. <laughs> That was the Bull Moose Minute. We're back with, uh, we concluded series one. Uh, that's with how they could say it in uh, the UK. Series mm-hmm. one of uh, Faulty Towers. Here we are. Uh, they, there was, what, four years in between? Yeah, 1979 mm-hmm. is when they picked back There's up. There's a writer's strike in the uh, with, That's right. Mm-hmm. Um, or some sort of strike, some and, sort of entertainment based uh, strike that kept the production from happening. And I'm curious. Uh, this might be a conversation for another mm-hmm. time too. But I want just curious if the uh, if the show picked up, like it, first of all, if it was rerun at all in those mm-hmm. years, and if it picked up any more respect or or a bigger fan base in, during that time. I mean, likely, um, right? I think I think just the mixed reviews like, were just like initially, and it was by people who just wanted something different from from John Cleese or felt that he should have done something different. But I think the the reaction from the public at large was that this is an awesome show, you know, yeah, and did really well. Um, in its initial run. Uh, so the first episode of this season, do you mind if I jump in on this one? Just because I, I, I love yeah, it so damn it. much. It's called Communication Problems. And this is like, okay, so with a character as terrible as Basil Faulty, how do you garner sympathy for him? Well, you match him up against a guest that's worse than he is. <laughs> and you actually, the guest in <laughs> question is this older woman who is deaf and has a hearing aid that she will not turn on because it wastes the batteries and, and uh, you know, can't hear people, is always saying, what, what, and just being very mad at them. And when someone finally yells loud enough so she can hear it, she's like, don't yell, I can hear you, all this. Like, she's 
She's absolutely impossible. <laughs> she wants a room with a bath and a view. She ends up being given, you know, but she insists, and I, you know, I make sure that I have this. And sure enough, her room has a bath and a view of the ocean. And she, you know, and <laughs> no, like, uh, like the bath is not big enough, and the view's not good enough, triggering Basil to be like. <laughs> You know, it's, it's Torquay, which is the town that it takes place in. Like, you know, did, did you expect, would you, you know, what does he say, like the Eiffel Tower or the Taj Mahal or something? Yeah, or the, or the French Riviera. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, yeah, she's just absolutely impossible. And also a subplot in this show is that one of the guests is of the horse betting variety and gives Basil a hot tip. Now, we've been made, we were made aware that Basil uh, doesn't, um, uh gamble anymore at basically at the request of Sybil. Like she just won't let him gamble anymore, but he really likes to do it. So he of course is a, is a dishonest <laughs> guy and he sends Manuel to do his bidding, sends Manuel down to um, put money on the horse, 75 pounds on the horse or no, he puts 10 pounds and he wins 75. So he's, so Manuel comes yeah. back with money for, for Basil. He ends up giving it to Polly it, it, at some point, it becomes like uh, uh, Sybil becomes like kind of aware of this money and whose it is, and then also at the same time, this guest loses uh, roughly the same amount of money, except it was eighty five pounds that she lost, or, or, or according to her, was stolen from under her mattress. I'm using my quote fingers. <laughs> um, and then you know, at a certain point, I think that uh, Basil gets gives it to the major to hide in his breast pocket, which then turns into this like. <laughs> horrible communication like like he's trying to keep it a secret from and then just like it just builds and builds and builds <laughs> and you actually this is one of the episodes where you <clears throat> even though like it's just based in him like sneaking around his wife you know but but also at the same time it's just like just let him fucking gamble like you know why does it like you know like what's the big deal as long as it's not like a problem or maybe it was a problem but it's like on one hand you just like just let the guy do this thing but he just does it anyway creates his own problems and of course by the end of it um you just like he, he you almost think he's gonna get away with it and of course he doesn't get away with it and the way he doesn't get away with it is in such beautifully uh just it's so uncomfortable and <laughs> yeah. cacophonous and the, the, it's just my it's my favorite episode there's not a missed joke in it um in just everything about it like every setup is great you know and you can see things coming and just like you know like the second he like hands the money to the major like oh fuck you know like this isn't gonna go yeah, of course <laughs> he gives it to the guy with no short-term memory <laughs> yeah, like that's gonna go great and then there's all kinds <laughs> yeah. of opportunities for people both the major and and Manuel, who like the English he does know, he takes very literally. There's no like you know, like he does. There's not like a metaphoric understanding of anything. Like so, if you're saying like you know nothing about this, you know, like I know nothing. <laughs> That's actually one of the things that pops into my head every now and then, just ra at random. I know I nothing. Know nothing. <laughs> um, yeah, and yeah. So I mean, without that one, it, I think that if I were to. If someone were maybe interested in the show personally, and I wanted to like mm -hmm. come out of the gate strong and be like, "Here's the episode. It's perfect." In my opinion, it's the Abbey Road of this of this <laughs> series. It's like you know, are other episodes better? Yeah, it depends on your mood. Who knows? They're all great, but this one's just flawless. Like you know, and 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 the, just the acting, the timing, everything about it. It's and it. it so uh, worthy of note is that as I was brushing up on some of the episodes, I'd already kind of dug into the the uh, series with my wife and we were sitting there watching them and like I'm like uncomfortable. I'm sitting there eating because we're eating in front of the TV like good Americans. And and so we're, I'm shoveling food into my mouth and like laughing and stuff. And I look over and my wife is just like she's kind of sunk into the couch and she's got a like really bad like C-shaped posture. Posture. Her arms are folded over her chest. Her mouth is just kind of small. And I was just like, "We don't have to watch this." She's like, "No, it's fine." Because she's like being like an awesome, supportive person, knowing that I need to kind of like basically like report on this. And uh, I was like, "No, like I'm just not. I don't want to. Like I'm putting you through this. I don't want to put you through anything <laughs> for yeah. a podcast." So I ended up like, you know, switching over to watching it on my own with headphones on. 
and we're sitting in the yard and I'm just like, I must have looked like a crazy person because I was laughing for so long and so loud to this, you know, this episode. Because to me, this is the one that it gets me every time. It's just so, so good. <laughs> Even when you see it coming, it's just like, it's so good. Uh, so the the first season of the show, every episode is a 10 out of 10. It's like, it's just absolutely fantastic. Sure. And somehow they managed to kick off the second season with the the best episode yeah. that had aired, aired so far at that yeah, point. Yeah, maybe an 11 like, out of 10. Somehow, somehow a perfect show got even yeah, better. Really, yeah, really. They really just tightened um, it up. And yeah, this guest is the absolute worst. So when I was preparing for, for this podcast, I just binged through all of these episodes mm. and this is not a show for binging no. <laughs> it's like it's like i could just my heart was beating out of my chest just because everybody every situation is so terrible every character mm. every like yeah and, th- and then on top of that you're laughing mm-hmm. hysterically so yeah as i said you probably just look like a crazy man if anybody that's can right. see you that's right yeah it's one of those shows <laughs> where it's it's, pro- it's best enjoyed like take an episode in or maybe two and then just digest them and, and review, <laughs> decompress. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but yeah, this woman is just so awful. And right out of the gate, she's like, she's cutting mm-hmm. in line. Like she insists that she gets uh, uh, change mm-hmm. made. And so finally, I think Polly's at the desk. She's like, all right, I'll make change. But then as soon as she's the lady's got Polly's attention, she just takes it over. She's like, no, I'm trying to deal with this other customer. Yeah. So she's like right out but of the gate. But you were serving me. <laughs> the like, worst. Yeah, yeah exactly. they can't. She's trying to explain to a deaf person, like, no, I was serving him first. But then I broke. He ale- he was kind enough to let me take care of your change thing, but I'm now I'm back to him. And she's just awful. She's awful. Yeah, she's oh awful. Um, um, and then, of course, this episode introduces a new cast member who is uh, Terry right, the Chef. Right, yeah. So they finally, and uh, Terry the Chef was instructed by John Cleese to play his part as though he were running from and hiding from the police. <laughs> In his place of employment, <laughs> which it, he's another character with very few lines and very little screen time, but they always make the the most of it when he's on screen. Like I feel like that instruction translates. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and his, yeah, his character actually is like pretty valuable many times in in the coming episodes. Uh, the next one being the yeah. psychiatrist, um, and this is we were referring earlier to to Basil not being able to. Uh, wrap his head around a female doctor and these, this couple checks in they're both doctors and he just you know just assumes yeah. that he assumes that the male doctor is like no we're both uh, two doctors he assumes that the male is like, oh you two have two doctorates, doctorates? <laughs> <laughs> he doesn't even say two doctorates like, no, I don't think yeah. he says oh you're two doctors oh, it's like, yeah it's true. idiot you can't even <laughs> Uh, he's like, no, each of us is a yeah. doctor. <laughs> and then he's like, and then he immediately goes into his his kiss assery, until which point he finds out that the woman is a pediatrician, which who he, who what he assumes that that's a foot doctor, and uh, and that he's a psychiatrist. <laughs> and then he becomes paranoid um, that he's just all the time just trying to get into Basil's head when really they're just on vacation. And he, of course, this is another mistaken <laughs> yeah. identity situation where he just misreads every situation. He thinks everything's about sex and he thinks everything is about like him just like getting inside his head. And uh, <laughs> and then there's uh, there's also a like, subplot involving like a young uh, fella, like, you know, kind of like your, you know, 70s sexy unbuttoned shirt guy, you know, with the medallions and stuff. Yeah, gold yeah. chain. And of medallion. course, Sybil's yep. just like drooling over him and like basil's like making fun of him and she's like oh whatever like why wouldn't i find him attractive and she's like totally like whatever basil you know um Mm -hmm. and then uh later in the show uh uh attractive young lady checks in and then basil turns into an idiot over her but sybil's having none of it (laughs) (laughs) and then he ends up in this series of just like with keep in mind with the psychiatrist in the hotel um uh, the the young fella takes uh, brings a lady up to his room, which is prohibited and you know the, against hotel policy, and and Basil's trying to bust him with the person in the room, and th- there is a person in the room, and he's trying to catch him in the act, 
And of course, he ends with his penchant for bursting into other people's rooms. He ends up in the, the young lady's room repeatedly. And she's just like so forgiving. And she's like, oh, I understand the mistake. Like why you're hiding in my armoire. Like, like what? And, you know, and, you know, and of course, like Sybil keeps catching him in this young lady's room. And she's like, you're pathetic. What do you think that, you know, a young woman would want to do like an old stick bug like you or something terrible. And then, you know, the psychiatrists are seeing this constantly and he's like climbing ladders and looking in windows, looking in the wrong windows, going in the wrong rooms, trying to listen through walls. He's just caught repeatedly, even though he's actually trying to bust somebody who is breaking the rules because he's such an insufferable ass all the time. Nobody believes him and they don't support him and let alone his wife. She is, you know, that kicks him out and, you know, and, uh. Yeah, she just like there's no excuse that he can make up, oh, including but not limited to a uh, hand that end uh, his hand ends up in like black paint or something. Of course, the, the black painted hand ends up on like you know, an incriminating uh, area. <laughs> um, that th- this is another classic one. Uh, yeah, this is definitely just like a if Basil was just like, okay, I know he's got somebody in there, but whatever. Mm-hmm. Like I'll just let it go. Right. Like, that could be it. That could no episode, but of course he's completely incapable yep. of that. To the point where when the guy orders champagne, he's like, Champagne mm-hmm. for one with one yep. glass. <laughs> and of course to make matters worse too, he is, he is fawning over this this guest. Like he's like yes. turned into like a yeah. bumbling, oh yeah, like idiot, like like a like a schoolboy. Um and then she's not even like giving him like any attention of that nature she's just being like pleasant and he's just like you know yeah um <laughs> it's also the one episode where we see a customer annoyed with sybil like where she won't stop talking oh, yeah, to the, 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 the handsome young man and he's just like oh yeah. god give me yeah. a break <laughs> you know but because most of the time is awful as she is to basil mm-hmm. everybody else seems to have you know a high opinion mm-hmm. of her yeah so in playing with the uh the kitchen theme that keeps coming up uh the kipper and the corpse i i Oh, you skipped. Oh, I did. I did. I did. A, I did. I skipped Waldorf a, salad. Yeah. Uh, sorry, <laughs> yes. still in the kitchen. <laughs> Which still, still in the kitchen, the kitchen theme. So, <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, Waldorf salad is, it features a uh, couple that checks in. One's in English. Uh, the 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 ladies from England who's lived in California, and she's married to an uptight American who does not play like a Californian, but rather like like a an asshole New Yorker kind of vibe. Yeah, he almost sounds like yeah, like the stiff yeah. Wall Street bossy. Like, Listen here, pal, I'm gonna bust yeah. your ass, you know. <laughs> um, and then, yeah, I mean, without like pulling the episode apart and like going like blow by blow, it's it's just for the first time in the series, Basil is met with a guest who breaks him down, like, and challenges mm-hmm. him, like directly steps to him, like I the. the other there are other terrible guests who challenge him in different ways, but this guy, I guess, directly confronts him. And uh, mm-hmm. oftentimes, when seen speaking to Basil in the dining room, he's clutching his butter knife and like aiming it at him, like he's gonna kill him <laughs> yeah. with it. Um, he just kind of plays into like the like the you know the broad like kind of bossy American guy stereotype, like I'll tell you what time it is and what we're gonna do here and what you need to do is get in there and tell that <laughs> chef to. So of course. He showed that they show up late. They're hungry and they're like, "Oh, kitchen's closed." And he's like, "You know, they're you know demanding Americans having none of it." So he gives Basil twenty pounds to keep the kitchen open. He then goes back, tr- tries to catch Terry before he leaves, offers him the twenty pounds. He's gonna do it, and then finds out that he's not in fact leaving to go to a karate class, which he told Basil he was going to, but he's going on a date. And he, Basil takes the money rather than just being like, "Who cares." And having the people be served a hot meal, uh, not cooked by an incompetent him or anyone else, <laughs> he takes issue with, I believe, uh, uh, tells him to go off and gallivanting with his Finnish floozy, I believe is the term on that one. Yeah. You know, <laughs> It's another uh, Basil forcing his conservative beliefs on Unacceptable, character, yeah. But... Unacceptable to be doing that. Yeah. Karate class, though. Yeah, I would, I'd rather compromise the integrity of my hotel even further than yes, give you. Yes, yes, yeah. You know. So, <laughs> you know, and it involves a Waldorf salad, which Basil does not know. It also involves a screwdriver, which you're presently enjoying. Uh, yeah, that's right. Uh, which Basil doesn't know because these are just like American things, you know, and he had not heard of them. But, of course, mm-hmm. like 
he's trying to like pretend he's pretending to talk to the chef that's not there. At one point, he's busted having an, a one person argument <laughs> where he's playing both characters. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah. This is also one that like the solution is presented like very early in the episode. Mm-hmm. Where basically, you know, the guy is demanding he wants a Waldorf mm-hmm. salad and Basil, even though they keep telling him the ingredients, Basil keeps like either walking away or just ignoring them or he just can't mm-hmm. get it. And he doesn't know what the Waldorf mm-hmm. salad is, but Sybil knows what it is and she comes in and she makes the salad orders and she brings it out to them. And then, of course, Basil is like, no, that can't be right. Or No, know, he, 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 did, he doesn't even know she's exchange. doing it. And he he basically says that they're, he tells the guy they're out of the fixings and she walks out with oh, it. Oh, that's right. And then he... He's already gone at that point. By the time she brings it out, he brings out the two green salads, and then the the butter knife comes out again. Yeah. Well, the guy starts eating it at one point, and then he comes and he takes yeah. it away because he's like, "Oh no, that That's can't right. be right." That's right. <laughs> you know, like I know what you ordered. That's she doesn't right. know yeah, what you yeah. ordered. <laughs> it's he's like, just such, yeah. he's such an asshole. And it just like keeps escalating over something that like was solved even without the chef mm. there <laughs> very early in the yep. episode. Yeah. So like, even though like in um, this case, like like the, the 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 American guest is super obnoxious. Super obnoxious. Yeah. But Basil's Basil manages to, manages to like out dick him, <laughs> yeah. despite being a f- just just an idiot. And he's doing it in the most cowardly way in this episode. He just caves. And he's just like, and he's just like pivoting and pivoting and trying to suck up and more lies and more lies and more lies. And it just it ends up <laughs> it ends up with like the the American just basically like having everyone who's staying at the hotel show and tell Basil <laughs> how terrible his yeah. place is. Like he gives courage to people who would otherwise not say anything. That's another thing they kind of lean into is like the difference between like the braggadocious and aggressive American vibe versus like the English who would just like, you know, they'll just sit there and like eat eat the crappy food and, and just be like, you know, not mention it because they don't want to like ruffle any feathers and that kind of vibe. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, let's let's jump over to uh, uh, now the pro- in proper order, the Kipper and the Corpse. Sure. And I, before I r- yes, wrongly my... went to that, I wanted oh, to hand it to you because I know that this is your favorite, right? It is my favorite. Yeah. So this is, as, uh, as he says, the Kipper and the Corpse, where uh, there is a guest who comes in at the beginning of the episode. He's not feeling well. Um, so he's going to go to bed, but before he goes to bed, he sibbles at the desk. He orders breakfast in bed, and while he is placing his order, Basil comes in and starts giving him a hard time about like, "Oh, you're not feeling well? Is it your legs? Are your legs a problem? You can't come down for breakfast. We have to bring it up to you." <laughs> yeah, he's berating him for an, a service <laughs> like, that they offer. Yeah. So yeah, the guy orders his breakfast. He goes to bed. Uh, the next morning, uh, they're all in the kitchen. And Basil <laughs> discovers that their kipper is um, expired, as well as some of their other food <laughs> items. But everybody <laughs> insists that it's okay. They're still good. They just put the dates on for safety. So Basil brings uh, the guy his breakfast. And he's so upset about the simple act of carrying a tray of breakfast upstairs that he's just berating this guy, not realizing that the guy has died in his sleep. <laughs> it's just a corpse yeah. lying in bed. He's busy yelling and whipping so he delivers- curtains open. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> So he delivers the food and he goes back downstairs, realizes he forgot to include milk. And so Polly goes back up with the milk and she discovers that the guy's dead. And of course, Basil jumps to the conclusion that he must have eaten the inspired <laughs> Kipper. That's Immediately. What him. <laughs> <laughs> the worst case of food poisoning in history. <laughs> He's such an idiot. <laughs> But now uh, they're tasked with, well, first, yeah, Basil thinks that he's murdered this guy. But then they're also, even once they realize that that's not the case because he never ate it, uh, they need to remove the corpse from the room while they wait for the coroner to show up, which means they need to get it downstairs and they need to get it into a place where people can't see it, which just leads to this, uh, as Spencer has called it, a ballet of cacophony. <laughs> just every single form of hijinks and buffoonery and shenanigans. Mm-hmm. That can take place. Yeah, like there's a weekend Oliver. at Bernie's vibe here. You know, <laughs> yeah. Trying to like sneak around the hotel with a corpse. <laughs> and there's so, uh, in addition to the major, there's two other permanent residents at the hotel. There's Mrs. Tibbs and Mrs. Gatsby. And they're these two sweet, nice old ladies. They're probably the only consistently like lovely characters in the show. And they're, you know, and they only get a little bit of exposure. But um, Basil is varying degrees of dismissive of them or or you know catering to their mm-hmm. needs but in this one one of the ladies sees the corpse and she freaks ah! out 
<laughs> and of course, Polly, being complicit in Basil's scheme, uh, tries to quiet Miss Gatsby by slapping her. And, and she slaps her so hard that they think they've killed <laughs> Mrs. Gatsby, too. And so for a second in the episode, they're trying to move around oh, two God. bodies. Until, oh like, until they realize that Mrs. Gatsby is actually yeah, still alive. Yeah, after they stuff them both <laughs> into the same closet. <laughs> because they're in a guest room. They're hiding a dead body in an, an actively yeah. used guest room. <laughs> to like, oh, God, it just never fucking stops with this guy. Uh, it's so good. But this is, uh, yeah, also, you know, it's the penultimate episode of the show. And it's also the final, the moment where Manuel has finally had yes. enough. There, he just has a breakdown at one point. He's like, no, I can't do it. No, I don't want to work yeah. here anymore. I don't like You're this. You're always yelling at me. You're always um, hitting me. He's always hitting <laughs> Manuel. It's like, you know, it, sometimes it's funny. Yeah. Sometimes it's like, oh, stop. Just, you know, it's funny because like they're, yeah. they're, they're both s- such brilliant uh, physical co- comedy actors. You know mm-hmm. what I mean? Like they, they move their bodies like in a very funny way. But like, man, it's just like you just hate watching Manuel constantly just like getting... Like, <laughs> there's a lot of a uh, oh sorry no no no, no. there's before. like there, there's only one to me that is, is truly just funny it's the one where he, he's like upset with Manuel and he has a spoon and he just like takes the spoon Ugh. and rubs it all over Manuel's face and across his teeth and it makes that like, sound and then he goes like boink on yeah. the forehead <laughs> my teeth oh, hurt God. watching that I don't know how they got through <laughs> that take though it must have been so funny. <laughs> <laughs> Um, I mean, yeah, speaking to like the 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 talents of their like the mm-hmm. physical talents, this episode in particular, I think, highlights how these two. I mean, the whole series, but this episode in particular, like the way these two actors work mm-hmm. together, because John Cleese is so tall and so lanky mm-hmm. and is so over the top with his mm-hmm. physical movements, and then you know Manuel is always kind of hunched yep. over a little bit and plays it kind of like small yep. and tight. Uh, but there's a lot of moments where they're like. You know, somebody will walk by when they're moving the body, so they'll stop and pretend that they're just casually <laughs> yeah. hanging out. And and Basil will do some sort of like big grand, you know, pose right. or something. And Manuel will do like will kind of copy his or mimic his <laughs> movements, but do this sort of like smaller, you know, <laughs> awkward version of the same pose. He doesn't know why he's doing it's it so necessarily. Good. He's just like trying to like <laughs> yeah. just just desperately trying to make it go away. Oh, yeah. yeah. So I mean, there's many many other moments in that show. Uh, in that particular episode that are are also perfect. And I'll, I'll agree, like, that could also be my favorite episode if the other one weren't already. Yeah. I also lied about this being the penultimate episode. We That's have two right. more left. That's right. Uh, uh, so we're coming we to are, the penultimate. We're getting there. Uh, the anniversary uh, wherein uh, this is just... We, we, we needn't get into, like, too much detail about it because the setup pretty much tells it all. It's their 15th mm-hmm. anniversary, Basil and Sybil, Sybil's kind of like lightly grilling him all morning, like anything today reminds you of. And of course, he's being a dick and pretending that he, you know, he's bringing up all these other events that it could be on that day and not their anniversary. Um, She gets pissed and leaves. And he's like, oh, shit, because he actually had done something nice for the first time in the whole show (laughs) and invited her friends over (laughs) uh, and then uh, to like have a, a dinner party, like an afternoon party. And... She's already stormed away, furious, and then instead of just telling everybody, like, I messed up, he then pretends that she's sick and upstairs. And, of course, her guests, who range from annoying to the the fucking worst, <laughs> you know, are all insistent that they see her, and they're just, like, they're jibing Basil, and you kind of, you want it to stop for him, but then you realize, like, no, this is a, of his own creation. He forces Polly to go into their bedroom and dress up like Sybil and lay in bed with a mouthful of cotton balls to play his <laughs> own sick wife. And like, you know, it, at a certain point plays it off. Uh, you know, it, it, he's not really getting away with it, but just due to like the, the, the proper British nature, like they can't actually prove that it's not her, although they all know that Basil's a jerk and that's probably not her. And one of them even sees Sybil downtown and and Basil goes as far as to like make up some some horseshit about her having a doppelganger. <laughs> um, that that's another like it's another great one. Um, a lot of great like physical comedy and a lot of just like truly just like choke worthy characters in that one as well. Yeah, 
you get the vibe that Sybil's friends know that Basil's full of shit and they're just like, they want so badly to catch him yeah, in this lie. Yeah, they love nothing more. But Basil's so practiced at right. <laughs> this. Right. And, it's like, um, I would say this is also the only one. So, like, constantly throughout the series, like, you know, Sybil bosses around Basil and he'll say some insults under his breath and she just, like, completely rolls mm. with it. Uh, this is the only one where, yeah, he tries to do something nice and it's also the only one that she, like, uh, gets like emotional yeah. at him for you know normally she doesn't care about his insults she just wants him to mm-hmm. do whatever he needs to do this is the only one where she's just like oh my feelings are hurt by something right. that you did um so it actually yeah it car- it, after having spent the rest of the season with these or whatever the rest of the show with these characters it's like yeah where we get a new emotional di- dynamic from both of them that we had yeah, seen the, before. The, you get like the uh, <laughs> uh, the hint that there is some shred of humanity between them and that the 15 year anniversary of marriage means something at least to both of them, even though he's he's so impossible that he can't just he can't just show it. He couldn't just like wake up and be like, "Big day plan for you, my dear. Don't you go anywhere." Yeah. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, or 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 even like plan a surprise party and just say like, you know, you know today is like today's our anniversary. Of course, of course, you know that I have a let's do dinner later and just provide a distraction and then distract her. Oh, your friends are here. Like that would have been so easy, yeah. you know, but he's taking pleasure in he her is. misery. <laughs> That's like that his he, anniversary that, present that he forgot. <laughs> to himself. Yeah. Oh, he's the worst. He's Which the brings worst. us to the final episode of the 12 yeah. episode two series show, Basil the rat. <laughs> um, you want to jump? You want to take this one? Great. Sure. Um, I love the, uh, the, the, the double meaning in mm-hmm. the title, which I will get to the second of the, those meanings is, uh, so an inspector shows up, inspects their kitchen, which predictably is absolutely disgusting. Mm. It's the first time we actually get a description of exactly how disgusting <laughs> yeah, their kitchen lengthy. is. <laughs> if it's been hinted at throughout the whole series that their kitchen mm. sucks. Um, and he's basically like, I'm going to come back for full inspection tomorrow. You've got 24 hours to get the place mm-hmm. cleaned up. And so Basil goes up to tell Manuel to clean the dead pigeons out of the water mm-hmm. tank. <laughs> mm-hmm. The water and tank that presumably the guests Manuel... have been drinking out of. Yep. Yeah. And sees that Manuel has what Manuel refers to as a pet <laughs> hamster, but Basil can easily see is just a rat, a huge rat. <laughs> and so he's like, Manuel, you got to get rid of this thing. The inspector's coming. Manuel doesn't want to get rid of it. He's like, I love him. Oh, my so Polly comes up with this scheme about her. She has a friend that lives nearby that will take care of the rat. But really what they do is just take him out back to a shed. <laughs> And Manuel has apparently left the cage open so the rat can run around the shed and get some <laughs> exercise, <laughs> which then leads to a rat in the yes. hotel on um, the same time that the inspector shows up to do the hotel mm-hmm. inspection. And basically, they've actually done a good job cleaning up the hotel. Like, the guy is yeah. uh, is about to give them high marks and whatnot, but there's also a rat mm-hmm. running around, which at one point the major sees and uh, tries to shoot with a shotgun. <laughs> in the hotel. <laughs> Yep. Yeah, <laughs> and at, at, at one point also uh, Basil takes a piece of the veal the lunch veal and covers <laughs> it in rat poison and leaves it on the floor doesn't tell anybody just leaves it on the floor and of course because of the way this show is constructed the, the veal comes out to serve you know out of the fridge to prep for lunch it uh, you know uh, Rube Goldberg of comedy boink 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 veal on the floor <laughs> rat poison veal up in with the veal which I, at one point also I want to note that Polly steps on with her heel and slips on this the rat poison <laughs> veal and it still ends up back in the food <laughs> to serve to people. Yeah. You know, that wasn't enough to take it out of the running. Like that they've they've every opportunity there's like two or three missed opportunities to get out of it and they just are always all doing the wrong <laughs> thing. And of course at this point the inspector has pretty much already signed off right. on the inspection. He's like, if you don't mind, I'm going to stay and have lunch, even though he saw the, the kitchen mm-hmm. the day before. <laughs> yep. Yeah. yeah. It's like, yeah, they almost So then it turns into, it. there's a cat also that <laughs> lives in the kitchen. <laughs> that uh, <laughs> <laughs> that uh, um, had got into the veal, and and Basil's like, oh, well, the, the that veal that the cat was eating is 
is good because it's not poison because the cat's not dead. <laughs> so he cuts off the chewed bit and serves that to the inspector. Then goes outside to see the cat, which was just coughing up a fur ball, but which Basil took as it dying. So then he runs out and has to take the plate. And then they're saying, like, well, if that's the poison piece, then all the other pieces are fine. So they cook up another and bring it out. And they realize the cat's fine. They're like, oh, wait, no, that was the good piece, which I believe they pull out of the trash and reserve to him. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's just like, it just never, ever stops. And, you know, and this show, like, ends with, like, a really, you know, not you know it's it's charmingly corny, but like you know like a a puppet a puppet rat in the biscuit box in being presented yeah. to the inspector, and and just like that, it is over. Yeah, that's, that's the, the end, end of the, the show. show. And of course, uh, I guess I, yeah, the Manuel has named his cat. Or, or sorry, his Manuel has named his rat. Oh yes, Basil. Yes. <laughs> so, <laughs> that's <yeah>. right. <laughs> So maybe he knew it was a rat That's all myth. along. <laughs> That's right. Yeah, yeah. That's exactly right. Um, yeah. I guess like one like before we like wrap up. Uh, one other thought on this show is that you know, uh, potentially troubling. I guess I don't know how I feel about it, except that I know I I do know that Andrew Sachs is a, a tremendous actor and did a great job with Manuel. And I didn't know until very recently um, that he in fact was not. Uh, a person of, of Spanish descent playing Manuel, but actually rather a, uh, a, a an English person by way of Germany. So, mm-hmm. you know, he, I, the, yeah, I think that 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 casting choice wouldn't have happened, wouldn't happen presently, you know, because of, of, of more encouragement for people, you know, who are actually, you know, yeah. <laughs> but it's it, but it's not like it's not like. I, it doesn't strike me as like as derogatorily racist as say like Mickey Rooney's part in Breakfast at Tiffany's, right? Yeah. Um, he actually like is in earnest playing someone from Barcelona who is working in England for a huge jerk, and that's the part, you know. And um, yeah, and it's a it's a beautifully played part. Um, Agreed. It's I, I have conflicting feelings on it. Uh, for all of the same reasons that, you, that mm-hmm. you pointed out, it's yeah, just having yeah, an, an English man of German descent playing a Spanish guy. Uh, but even though he is at like the center of so many, so much of the humor mm-hmm. in this show, it's never at his no. expense. It's at the expense of the misunderstanding, or you know, I guess yeah, almost hundred percent of the time, it's at the expense of the misunderstanding or the physical aspect yeah. of it. Um, so it's not like it makes, you know, even though they comp- always dismiss him with, oh, he's from yes. Barcelona, like that's okay. And, you know, when guests complain about him, they, he's like, oh, you think that's bad? We have to be yeah, with him all yeah, the time. Yeah, they, com- they complain to the guests night. about the help that they hired, that they have insufficiently <laughs> yeah. trained. And yeah, they're always throwing him under a bus. So, and, and and if it were not the case, it would be impossible to watch. If they if, if Manuel were the brunt of the jokes, like we wouldn't be talking about the show right now. Um but yeah. it is Basil who's the brunt of all the jokes because he is the supreme, uh, the supreme asshole of the group. That's right. If you're going to say that this show makes any group of people look bad, it, it would be English. the English. <laughs> Correct. <laughs> yeah. Well. <laughs> so, uh, oh, uh, also, just one more thing. Uh, I, like you, also didn't know that about Andrew Sachs mm-hmm. until recently. But I read that so when this show was dubbed for uh, mm-hmm. German for, uh Andrew Sachs speaks German, so he dubbed his own part for the for the German language mm-hmm. version of it. But which also means that he had to figure out how to do a yeah a Spanish person trying to speak German kind of broken dialect thing for that yeah, as well. German with a Spanish um, accent. So I have yeah, I I would like to find indeed, clips of that indeed. and check it out. Yeah, and apparently, like uh, when when the episodes aired in Spain, they they made Manuel from not Spain because he didn't play. Right, mm-hmm. um, I forget where, but like, just not, not Spain. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah, it's funny how much they had to like kind of switch around for context sake, Manuel's origins. You know, mm-hmm. um, so that's uh, that's what we think about Faulty Towers. Yep, one of the greatest comedies of if all time. If not the greatest comedy of all time. Mm-hmm. Good first show, bud. Yeah, I feel good. good about that. You should. I feel like I'm 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 this much closer to calling you my <sighs> best friend. God damn it! 
It's <laughs> rubbing my nose in it. <laughs> All right, we'll see you next week. You can do also uh, tune into our uh, YouTube channel called Top Ten Takeaways. Uh, I mean, if you've already listened to all of this, then we probably covered all the takeaways, but our YouTube channel will deal weekly with the very same topics that we speak of on this show. So this week's top 10 takeaways is about Paul D. Towers. I want to thank our sponsors, Main Spirits, Bull Moose, and Sun Tiki, whom you can find at MainSpirits.com, BullMoose.com, and SunTikiStudios.com, respectively. And... Um, We'll see. We'll see what I can do over the course of the next this next week, the coming week, to um, vault myself into a solid best friend position with Zach Notes. <laughs> and we'll continue to work on pulling down that Facebook sponsorship by what a piece him. of shit website that is. <laughs> yeah, that it's sucks. A website? Yeah, I guess it's a website. It's more of an app. <laughs> website, sure. Web, Web space. space. Yeah. Hey, Facebook, you suck. Give us some money. Please. <laughs> yeah. All right. See you next week. Right. Thanks for listening, bye, everybody. Bye. See you next week. Bye bye. It's time for happy hour, presented by Main Spirits. If someone said to you right now, Diane, Diane, make me a daiquiri, you might be like, I can't make a daiquiri. I don't have one of those things in my house. I don't have a. I can't make a daiquiri. And what I say to you, Diane. I'm looking at you, Diane, is yes, you can. <clears throat> a daiquiri doesn't need the frozen whoop de doo hurricane machine or whatever the heck that is. A daiquiri is actually a simple, straight-ahead and classic cocktail that has been morphed into something almost entirely different. But you can, in fact, make a daiquiri at home, and right now we're going to show you how to do so. So for tools, we will need a jigger, a shaker, a strainer, and a martini or a coupe glass. For ingredients, we'll need plantation three-star rum, fresh lime juice, and simple syrup. Let us build this drink. To your shaker, add two ounces of plantation three-star rum, one ounce of fresh lime juice, and a half ounce of simple syrup. Now add ice and shake until very cold and strain it into your glass. Despite what you may have learned before, you've made a daiquiri. Now reward yourself. Always refreshing, always delicious, tastes like summer, tastes like celebration. Rum is easily enjoyed with nearly any fruit juice, and um, nearly any of them can be called a daiquiri. Here's some substitution ideas, people. Sub grapefruit juice for the lime juice, or use a half ounce of each. Or sub the simple syrup for maraschino liqueur and make a classic Hemingway daiquiri. Use crushed ice and blend all the ingredients together in a blender for a frozen treat. And then that looks more like Old Orchard Beach. This has been Happy Hour, brought to you by Main Spirits. You can learn more about these cocktails and other cocktails at mainspirits.com. Or download their app for easy access to good drinking ideas. Or follow them on Instagram at main underscore spirits. But regardless of where you follow them, regardless of what you learn, we want you to drink deliciously and responsibly. Spencer and Zach Explore the Universe is brought to you by Main Spirits. You can visit them online at mainspirits.com or download their app or visit them on Instagram at main underscore spirits. The show is also brought to you by Bull Moose, serving Maine and New Hampshire's music, movie, video game, and book and trinket needs since 1782. Also brought to you by Sun Tiki Studios at 375 Forest Avenue or at suntikistudios.com. Spencer and Zach Explore the Universe is a Mistakes Were Made production.